Kia ora. Welcome to Conversations with Wahine, brought to you by the Wellington branch of the National Council of Women, New Zealand. Hello, everybody. Uh, today we have Camilla Bilich and my co host, Harita. I'm Haley. And I'm really excited to start this interview today. <laughs> so, uh, Camilla Billich, she has a standing role as a List MP based in Epson and Chair of Labour Auckland Caucus. She has a background in employment law and was co-president of the New Zealand University Students Association. In 2005, she led a successful campaign for a fairer student loan scheme and in high school, she helped secure funding to establish Evolve, a dedicated youth health service still operating today. Camilla remains a strong advocate for women and the families that they support, and she has worked extensively on pay equity policy and on legal claims seeking equal pay for work. Thank you again so much for joining us. Clearly, oh, you nice. have extensive backgrounds as far as politics and the matters that we are going to discuss is concerned, so... I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. But firstly, Thanks for having what me. brought you? <laughs> What's that, sorry? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what brought you into the world of politics? Well, um, as you've just mentioned, a lot of what I've done in my life has been about um, progressive change and just being involved with things, which make things a little bit a little bit better for our communities and so uh, I had been working as a lawyer for about 13 years and had been really interested in doing cases which were what what we'd call kind of in, in the union movement as strategic cases that would um, change the law or improve or clarify position which was beneficial for working people and the opportunity to stand for Labour came up in, in 2020 you know before all of the pandemic and everything um happened um but I just thought well these opportunities don't come up um all the time and I felt that was at the stage of my career where I was looking for something to do something slightly different uh and decided uh to just yeah put my hand up to stand for parliament to see if I could maybe do uh, the sim similar kind of work, but in a, a slightly different role um, as a representative. And I was really um, happy and honoured to be elected in 2020 and have had, um, yeah, a really interesting almost three years now uh, being an MP. Were you, prepared, were you prepared for the wild ride that essentially <laughs> came with being an MP during COVID? During COVID? <laughs> Um, I don't know if anyone can really be prepared for <laughs> what, what we went through. Uh, I'd also, um, I had a baby, I was pregnant during the election campaign and I had my um, youngest child uh, uh, in February of 2021. So um, you probably hear him actually on the monitor. <laughs> that. Oh, that's um, and so there was a lot of change uh, for our family at that time. Uh, but I think... Uh, throughout New Zealand, everyone was coping with different circumstances and different challenges within their families and workplaces and learning and schools. And I think our experience was uh, unique as MPs, but I think a lot of people had really unique and different and challenging experiences during that time. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, one of the politicians I was interviewing earlier today, I actually didn't know this, but she mentioned that politicians don't actually get parental leave mm. or sick pay. Is, is that correct? I'm, I'm yeah, assuming. well, we're not employees, so we're not yeah. employed. Um, and a lot of the benefits with that come with being employed are things like, you know, maternity, um, well, parental leave, although that, that can sometimes be for self-employed people too. Uh, but I think on the whole, um, a lot of our leave is determined by the speaker. And recently our speakers have been um, very generous uh, to allow leave for personal circumstances. So I, I definitely don't think we are hard done by. I think people are usually... <laughs> 
they we get quite good um quite good uh leave from um the speaker usually and and because a lot of us are part of a bigger team um you, you know if someone's sick or if someone's had a baby or if someone's got a bereavement in their family we're able to cover that for them so I think compared to most people even though it's not a right per se we we definitely um are really fortunate in terms of the provisions that we get hmm. so how did you juggle being a new mother and also being elected into parliament for the first time pretty much all at the same time well it was uh challenging in in some ways but um i think that actually again um in terms of uh the way that i was able to uh have my son near me and in many ways i was luckier than a lot of other um new um well I've other children as well but parents would be uh in the workplace so I took my son to select committees occasionally. You know, I would feed him in select committee meetings. I would, um, I was able to have him in my office. I would uh, bring him into caucus. And a lot of people don't have that opportunity. So although it was challenging in some ways, it was also a very, it's also a very um, welcoming and, and permissive environment for parents. So I felt in a way quite fortunate to have that. Yeah, that's really good. I feel like New Zealand Parliament's probably one of the few places that actually allow the MPs to do that, which just makes it, you know, it makes that barrier less, that being a new mother shouldn't stop you from becoming a politician. Yeah, and I had lots of great examples of people who had done that. For example, obviously Jacinda um, Mm -hmm. having had Neve when she was Prime Minister, and I, I was really surprised, actually. I thought that being a candidate who was pregnant, I thought people would raise it with me that that maybe that wasn't a good idea or that maybe that wasn't the right choice um and they didn't really I mean maybe some people thought it but they didn't raise it with me and I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that they'd seen that if you can have a baby while you're prime minister where you should be able to do a lot of other things um and have a baby so being 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 an MP wasn't seen as such a and having a baby wasn't seen as such a unique or challenging circumstance yeah so I guess on the note of having a baby or going on parental leave um, there's a lot of talk at the moment about um, parental leave policies that are that might be introduced so while it's been extended um, parental leave's been extended under a labor labor government and the recent announcement was that there's an intent to give men four weeks off paid parental leave but why did they shoot down the prospect of a shared parental leave which enables families to choose which arrangements work best for them yeah so the policy that we've come out with would allow um leave to be taken at the same time by and it would be um you know it would be two two parents uh so you know whatever gender they they happen to be uh would be entitled to um decide that one person was the primary carer and another person was uh uh the not the the other parent or the secondary carer for that baby and uh it could be taken at the same time the difference in our policy really is that would be paid um, and it wouldn't be taken off the time that uh, was quite hard fought for. So uh, the Labor government brought in um, the original entitlement to uh, parental leave and then the entitlement to six weeks, 20, 26 for babies, was a was a big campaign. That um, I was I was in London for a for a lot of that time, but some really close friends of mine uh, were involved in that campaign. And and when I came back to New Zealand, I was kind of involved at the tail end of it. But it was a campaign that ended up um, convincing most people in Parliament to support six months paid parental leave. But it was unfortunately vetoed um, by Bill English, who was finance minister at the time. It's something that I hadn't been aware of until that point. As if you, even if you have the votes in Parliament, if there's a cost aspect to a particular bill and this was a private uh, this was a member's bill sorry in the um the name of the Labour MP Sue Moroni then the the government uh doesn't actually have to implement it because it has financial implications for their budget so that's um 
something that came in um, in 2017 uh, under the Jacinda Ardern uh, first term of that government. And I think that people have been talking about uh, the additional support that parents needed, um, usually mothers, um, during that first little period and and a, and a desire to follow models overseas where there was paid leave during that time. So um, I think it, it was a good um, suggestion that in Nicola Willis's bill, and it was something that we took really seriously, but in the end, we decided that a better policy would be to make sure that that's paid and the evidence shows that to make it really useful to make well to encourage people to actually take that leave it does have to be paid dedicated leave often if if, often if it's just um, permitted to be shared within the scheme evidence from overseas is that people don't actually end up using it because it um usually what happens when people have babies is they you know one person might take on the earning and other person might do unpaid work taking care of the child so I think it's um uh I think that that was the right decision uh but it didn't mean that we didn't think about uh that bill really carefully and I I gave a speech in the house about it and we did consider that because we do see that there is a need for partners leave Uh, it's just that our preference is that it's paid and the reason our preference is for that is because we don't want to take those hard fought one uh wins away from the primary carer and we also want to make sure that if partner leave exists that uh, partners are supported to take it so that was the, that was the reasoning really what about in the instance where there might be a father who would like to be the primary carer is he still only available to get those four weeks paid parental leave no the, the father can take um and that example could take could be uh, the primary carer okay. uh, and could take it's a it's not the birthing of the child is not really the determining factor um, or the gender of the parent it's just really at the moment only one person can be um, in that category um, and and so it's about giving and usually one person has that entitlement so I think the changes that we're discussing is really giving an entitlement to a second person uh, and but it could be the mother or the father, and that's under national or labor scheme, or or two mothers or two fathers. That's really cool. I think it opens it up a lot to women who do want to continue working, yeah. and I think that means that a lot of fathers will be able to create a much more intimate bond with their newborns. I think that's probably been an ongoing issue as parents yeah. because that connection early on is just so important, but often. I think fathers only had about two weeks paid parental leave not too long ago. So, I mean, that, I don't think it's paid. Different. It's just um, leave. So, yeah. Unpaid. yeah. So mm-hmm. it's unpaid. So, I mean, I think a lot of us um, who've um, had children or have friends who've had children will know that, you know, often the, the story when um, a parent goes back to work, the other parent goes back to work and the, the, parent who's at home is kind of left with the baby just thinking how am I going to cope with this Mm -hmm. and you know being really emotional about it and we do know that there's a lot of evidence about um, mental health struggles for parents during those early days as well so I think increasing the amount of support around uh, those families can only be beneficial. Yeah absolutely Uh, moving on from that I've been seeing quite a bit about the fair pay agreements and it seems like you have quite a bit of history with that. Uh, While New Zealand has been focused on a low cost labour model, uh, a bid for cheaper contracts and labour costs have pushed prices lower essentially when it comes to giving people pay, fair pay and fair treatment. But with the recent introduction of fair pay agreements, I'm assuming that this is all about to change. Are you able to give us a brief overview of what it entails? Yeah, so fair pay agreements are about allowing industry-level agreements in certain sectors. So essentially they provide a floor of entitlements and rights, and so that's not just pay, that could be terms and conditions as well. We know that there are a lot of sectors where uh, something's happened and it's sometimes described as a race to the bottom. And one uh, one example of that is with bus drivers where um, usually local authorities have tendered for contracts for 
bus drivers and then because they don't obviously don't want to spend more money than they need to they've been accepting the lowest offer and unfortunately that's meant lowest lower pay for people in those jobs that they've engaged and also in terms of conditions as well for example split shifts that are really difficult for people so um, maybe long periods of time where they have to sit in the bus depot but they're not being paid um, makes it difficult for them to spend time with their family it makes it unattractive to to be in that job and difficult for those who stick with it and we know that public transport's really important um, for many reasons uh, but you know also for our um, emissions bring down our emissions we want to increase the use of public transport so in that particular sector I think if, if a fair pay agreement was able to be reached what it would really provide for is uh, it would be, provide for employers and employees getting together and thinking, well, what is actually reasonable in this sector? And what do we think uh, are the minimum terms and conditions that people should um, be offering to stop to stop really companies undercutting each other? And we've actually heard from employers to say that they're actually a lot of the in a lot of instances really supportive of that because they want to be good employers. Most employers really, want to be um want to be good employers and take good care of their employees so uh it's been frustrating for some people in some industries because if they put in a tender which pays their staff well they haven't been accepted because of the cost implications of that so there are there are quite a few benefits to it it's really common overseas to have industry type agreements uh, we used to have a similar type of arrangement in New Zealand and what we do see in those countries that do have these types of agreements is higher productivity and we know that productivity has been a really big problem for New Zealand in terms of our comparative productivity compared to other countries. So I think that there are many benefits to it. Um, and I, I think the thing that I would really like to see is some of those fair pay agreements put in place so everyone can see uh, how useful they are, how much security they give people when they're deciding on a particular career path and uh, how much um, how beneficial they can be in terms of um, allowing that career progression and not uh, also allowing um, terms and conditions to be consistent across an industry, uh, but also reasonable conditions that people want to work in. Hmm. So also on that, while, while we all know that attributing more value to labour and content and happy staff will drive productivity, would it also result in hiring hesitancy or perhaps create larger workloads for current employees? I, I don't know if that would necessarily follow. I think that um, we often hear about hiring hesitancy from employers, and we know, uh, and all of us would know, that um, it's something that's taken really seriously by employers and employees. You don't apply for every job you see advertised when you do apply for it. It's usually something that people take really seriously in terms of thinking, how will this job work for me? Especially if you're interviewed, there's um, a lot of thought that goes into whether there's an appropriate match between an employer and an employee um, in a job uh, situation. The, at the moment, there, I don't think that there is anything that would necessarily be in a fair pay agreement, which would make... Um, which would make the situation of dismissing someone uh, harder necessarily. Uh, that would be up to the parties in the fair pay agreement to discuss if they wanted to have an additional um, uh, requirement above and beyond what's already a minimum in the law. Uh, so in terms of that aspect of it, it, it may, that may it may be that there are additional requirements that people need to go through in terms of um, a process when the employment relationship isn't working out, but it may not be as well. Uh, and I, I wouldn't, I would say that probably the opposite is true in terms of uh, the effect on staff because staff uh, and, um, and their representatives will be involved in setting the terms for fair pay agreements. So hopefully they would be able to mitigate against the possibility of having too much work 
uh, that's not sustainable because they would maybe have policies that they could get employers to agree to that would mean that they had a an appropriate balance between the tasks that they were meant to do uh, within a certain period of time. So it could even help those types of problems, I would think. If you're considering something such as employers' profitability and ability to handle the extra pay, I I think it would be safe to assume that there wouldn't be extra hiring hesitancy when it comes to new staff. But is is that something that you will be carefully taking into account? So it wouldn't it wouldn't be up to politicians to determine what's in fair pay agreements. They'll be negotiated yeah. with um yeah. with um parties themselves. Um and I mean I think that I I don't and I haven't heard any proposals um, about make uh, that we that we're um, putting forward to make it easier to um, uh, basically sack people from their job um, because we think that the current situation is good. I do know that some other political parties have talked about returning ninety day trials to all workplaces. At the moment, they're only in small workplaces, and I've got a lot of concerns around that because um, I don't think it's fair to uh, dismiss someone for no reason. Uh, and I think that um, big employers um, who at the moment don't have access to 90 day trial periods have the, usually have the resources to be able to manage uh, and upskill staff um, and, uh, you know, make training available if there's any, any issues uh, with that staff member and how they're working. Uh, if it's a if it's a bigger problem, then of course um, there's the there's other options of going through dismissal procedures, which are always available if there's fair cause for that. Uh, but I'd, I'd be hesitant, and I am concerned about policies that would make um, make it more likely that people would lose their jobs. Yeah, I think uh, more what I was getting at was. When it comes to hiring new employees in the first place, I mean, I'm I'm assuming mean about there will be a, a general consensus that employees and employers can come to, but obviously, if they can't agree, then it goes elsewhere to make that decision. But mm. is that is that a general concern amongst either politicians or people involved that there could be some hiring hesitancy as far as actually getting new people in when we need them? Well, I think fair pay agreements would probably make people more confident uh, in terms of the in terms of both employers and employees because there's more clarity. So an employer will know clearly that they can't pay and have terms and conditions which are less than the fair pay agreement. So that would give them certainty to be able to budget to make sure that they um, could afford to bring on new staff. Uh, and um, from the employee side, they would have more certainty to know that their terms and conditions would be, you know, at least as minimum um, set out in the fair pay agreement. So that would give them more certainty as well. Um, I mean, these types of arrangements, a fair pay agreement essentially will just mean that certain conditions are mandatory within people's contracts, but people still these days have contracts anyway. They have either individual contracts or collective agreements. The thing that would change would that there'd be more consistency in these types of agreements and they'd probably provide for more minimum standards. So it's mm. kind of, from my perspective, a better type of employment agreement. Uh, but it, I don't think it would necessarily increase um, hesitancy um, in and of itself. It would just provide more clarity and, and basic standards for working people. Okay, so it's less about potentially raising uh, raising wages to an a point to a point where companies may not be able to handle it quite so well, but just more about creating a a blanket regulation that we can all follow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it, it's likely that some of the terms and conditions might be um, uh, better than what's currently offered at the moment. And so in that sense, it might be that, that, that there are higher so. wages because <laughs> um, that would be the point. I mean, if you weren't going to improve anything, there wouldn't be much point in, um, in doing it. But um, it would just it would have to be agreed between employers and employees. The fair pay agreement would only 
um, come about if there was that um, agreement um, and, and there's some there's some provisions in the legislation if they can't reach agreement but generally it will be a balance of uh, both sides concerns and there may be some stuff which is really non-controversial probably I think um, and probably doesn't cost a lot in terms of how people are treated with communication that kind of thing um, you could put on a fair power agreement which would give people more confidence uh, in their work, but wouldn't necessarily cost more. Uh, and it might be that there are minimum standards of pay um, that may be slightly higher than the minimum wage, but there's nothing requiring them to be higher. The next part is that, you know, many studies show that more pay can also mean a better economy, but then too much pressure on businesses to sustain the added cost can also have a dangerous ripple effect. So, Will the employer's profitability and ability to sustain increased wages be considered in these new policies? I think we we yeah. kind of already asked that question, yeah. actually. So it might it might be worth kind of moving on. I think it's one yeah. of the ones that we just kind of cover as we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's good it's good to have a good discussion about them though because they are new, and I think it is important that people have clarity about about what's included and what's not um yeah so I think it's been really helpful to just go through some of that yeah also right now especially when it comes to us researching questions we kind of pull from concerns that public may have Mm -hmm. and sometimes that's driven by the opposition so regardless how we may even feel about it I think it's quite good to be able to bring it in and actually give you an opportunity to talk about it without being without being interrupted or having contentious conversation like it you know like it always goes around election year right yeah <laughs> yeah definitely yeah, then the, the next part to that I guess you know if people are getting paid better wages and their standard of living increases as a result of that would that also drive up the cost of living and leave eligible workers struggling just as much as they were before um, I think that's, yeah, that's possibly, um, I guess something that could happen if everything was raised at the same time. Um, but I think the chances of that all occurring, so, you know, employees getting a wage increase and then inflation being, continuing to be super high and the cost of living continuing to be super high indefinitely is probably an unlikely scenario I mean we have at the moment a situation where we do have really high cost of living and we've also had really high inflation but we've also had wage growth which is I think slightly outstripped um, inflation in most instances I'd need to double check um, that I think it's been pretty close like obviously we're in a really inflationary environment Um, But one thing that is definitely certain is that we've um, got one of the lowest unemployment rates that we've ever had Mm -hmm. um, since we've had um, records. And also um, the minimum wage has gone up significantly during the period of time that Labor's been in power, I think about $7. And now you'll see when you look at the living wage and and the minimum wage, you won't see as much of a difference as you would have seen six years ago between what people have to be paid at minimum and what people can actually um, have as a living wage, which is obviously separate to the government. So, um, yeah, wage growth uh, and employment uh, has been really important to allow New Zealanders to cope with the cost of living that we've had. Uh, So, yes, sometimes um, wage increases can be uh, less useful if, if there's a high inflationary environment and a high cost of living but it's it's kind of important that those things go um, hand in hand if there is high inflation it's obviously important that we have those wage increases and um, mm-hmm. if there are high prices then we, we obviously want to see wages increase as well yeah I think like it kind of just reminds me of like the issue that people have now right where inflation and cost of living in general is it's just increasing year on year but when people look at how much of a CPI increase they're getting at work, it just doesn't add up. You know, you might be getting a 2 or 3% increase at work, but you look at how much groceries cost today compared to last year, and it's much more than 3%. Mm. Um, and, like, yeah, it's, people are struggling to keep up on the same money that they had previously. Yeah, and I definitely acknowledge that, and I think it has been a really tough time for people. And you would have seen a lot of the policies that we have announced recently have been 
targeted to try and assist people with areas which have been particularly tough um, in the cost of living area. So, you know, um, the charges taken off prescriptions so people can get their prescriptions without being charged. Often that won't be necess- that wouldn't have been a, a really large charge, but um, we do know that people were not picking up medication because of that charge. And when you're sick, um, it's obviously really important that you take the the medicine that you that you require at that time. So we've we've had that we've had a um, increase to the eligibility for twenty hours free childcare, um, half price public transport for uh, young people. Um, the dental announcement that we just had for people under 30, all of them are, are targeted, the GST of, of fruit and vegetables, they're all um, not not hugely um, spending as much as, as you know, you might want to um, to make people's lives significantly easier, but restrained, obviously, because of the difficult situation that we're in with um, having uh, an inflationary environment followed um, following on closely from a global pandemic. So, they've, yeah, they've, they're really attempting to make um, meaningful changes in small ways to people's lives to to help bring some of those costs down, and especially people with um, with kids, people who are younger, who might not have the same salaries, uh, and with in relation to accessing important services like like medication um, and and like dental care, it's really really important. Yeah, I haven't read too much up on the dental care one. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to get some details on that, though. Obviously, yeah. these fair pay agreements, they're a huge win for unions. I think unions used to be quite big. They helped a lot of people, and then they just started to drop in some countries. I, I assume they started to drop because they were actually helping some people, and then they got the help they needed, and then they no longer participated in unions. What do you think this means for unions now? Do you think they're going to get a lot more support? Will they be able to make a bit of a comeback or will it be a little bit less necessary with these fair pay agreements in place? Well, I've always believed in the power of unions. Um, I've always been a member of a union and I worked for a number of unions as well um, uh, in various roles and most recently as a lawyer. And the reason I think that they're important is because I think in every employment relationship often there's a power dynamic where the employer has a lot more power than the employee and I think that's true really in almost every role that you have it's very difficult to find an example where that dynamic doesn't exist and so what unions have always tried to do is to equalize that relationship somewhat so to provide people with advocacy on minimum rights um, health and safety is also another big area where unions have made a huge contribution uh, with wage rises um, with um, just general terms and conditions they've been um, really important and often um, that's the the only way that you can have a more equal relationship and we know that work is really important for people that's not just to earn a living but it's also to do with self-esteem and uh, con- being able to contribute and and feeling that sense of self-worth so um, having a job and feeling like you're uh, well um, that you're being respected um, and that uh, you're being treated fairly so not you know hugely high expectations that people have is really important for people and and how they feel so unions I think will always have a role um I saw recently I can't remember exactly where it was but it was an article that said a unions unions are becoming cool again or something so (laughs) I think it was an American piece um on unions so I don't know watch the space maybe that maybe everyone will want to join a union because it will be um super popular now but um yeah I think that uh when you when you co- organize collective action and that's what unions are is there a group of people joining together you you create a more powerful base and that's always going to be challenging for people in power to see to see that and often when we see unions um lose lose popularity and lose power it's because they have been challenged in that way and that's not to say that they've always been perfect there's lots of um you know every societal issue has probably been reflected in trade unions at some point in their history uh but a lot of that has been because they 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 challenge um a power structure uh and and the the objective is to create a fairer uh health healthier safer 
uh, more well-respected workforce. Yeah. On the basis of uh, combating power structures, I'd be interested to know more about the gender pay transparency. How are you planning to implement that? So pay transparency is something that um, has been implemented in a lot of different countries. Um, and it's basically with the gender pay gap, we, there's a persistent gender pay gap in most countries. And we know that there are a lot of contributors to the gender pay gap um, being stubbornly there. Um, and one of the areas that um, has con contributed to it has been the lack of transparency over wages. Um, and so one area that uh, seeks to combat that is through getting uh, individual um, organisations to actually audit the pay that they have and and report on that. So partly so that employees and, and people on the outside can see what they're doing, but also um, I think it's been a really useful exercise. Most companies that have voluntarily done it um, have found it to be a really useful exercise. It's perhaps opened their eyes a wee bit to if there is actually um, some power dynamic or a uh, some issue that they need to address in terms of the uh, type of representation and remuneration that they see uh, within their own workforce. So what the uh, Minister for Women announced recently was that um, New Zealand would uh, have a pay transparency structure and it would start out with quite big uh, companies having to report and it would move then to um, smaller companies of around 100 um, employees to be able to report um, on their overall uh, pay gaps. Uh, and one of the things that we're looking to implement in that is um, also ethnicity pay reporting, because we know that uh, for Māori and Pacific women, uh, specifically in New Zealand, uh, that um, there are a much greater pay gap com compared to other demographic groups. So um, a, a larger issue um, to remedy in those areas. And I think you, you would have heard it all the time that sunlight is the best disinfectant. And so pay transparency is really about shining light on, on an issue and, and and hoping that that will result in, in more equitable remuneration for people. Hmm. Would there, um, with this transparency, would there ever be a penalty for companies that do have a big gap between um, their pays? It might be that there is um, some kind of penalty regime. Usually with pay transparency measures, the penalty is for not reporting rather than for actually having a, mm. a pay gap. The, the, the main penalty that you'd be likely to see would probably be more that um, if you had a company and they had a significant pay gap um, within, say, uh, a job title, you know, so the woman for example, were paid a lot less than the men, or it could it could easily be the other way around in terms of our um, law, then those um, women could uh, probably take another type of legal claim um, about discrimination or under the Equal Pay Act as it, it was originally drafted to remedy that situation. So um, most likely the main penalties would be um, if you don't report, some pay, pay transparency regimes, like in the UK, when they first introduced it, there wasn't a penalty regime. So it was just that there was a rule you had to report, but there wasn't necessarily consequences if you didn't. Um, but I think um, most regimes, yeah, there's there's some kind of um, penalty if you don't report, but usually the penalty for having the gap is... Um, well, first of all, it's not very good a good look for a big company to have a significant gender pay gap that might do that might not be very good for their reputation uh, amongst the public. And the second thing would be that if it was if it was provable that there was discrimination, then they could face legal challenges. Yeah, and I guess if they're reporting in the first place, they'd try to make sure that there isn't much of a gap before they report because they don't want to look bad <laughs> themselves. Yeah, and I I think I mean I'm not. I don't because I don't know exactly what the regime will look like. I'm not sure to what extent that will be possible. But in a way, that type of behaviour is also helpful because um, that we actually just we actually just want the problem to be solved. 
Uh, mm. We want people to be aware of um, where they might have practices which could be viewed as discriminatory and, and to fix those. So uh, that that might be a, um, a silver lining of implementing the regime is that people just have a bit of a look and see how, how their report looks. I, I know that in the UK when they introduced it, the BBC did um, some reporting and there was quite a lot of media attention where they had significant discrepancies and in, in pay for their um, really high earning presenters and I think there's been quite a bit of work to, to remedy that so it's an example of how that type of regime can can really assist. Hmm. So would you base value of pay on estimated satisfaction of employees to drive interest and satisfaction in sectors that are struggling to find workers? Yeah so I think um and I think as we discussed previously the you know, pay, I don't think there's anything that we would be introducing apart from the minimum wage that we've committed to increasing that would actually set the rate of pay. Uh, but it would be up to individual organisations if they were doing fair pay agreements to uh, set a rate of pay above the minimum, which is which is already the law. Um, and if they decided that uh, they wanted to have a, a salary range which was higher, then that need to be taken into account, the affordability I mean, I don't, um, in terms of value, I don't think um, the amount that you get paid is reflective of the value of your work. I think all work, uh, a job worth doing is a, a job worth having. And, and a lot of people do really um, important work that keeps this economy going and they're not paid above the minimum wage. So I think we have to be, you know, respectful of of all different types of work. And um, I think making sure that the minimum standards like the minimum wage continue to, rate, to continue to rise is one way that we can show that we do appreciate and respect um, all workers. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a good answer. I really appreciate you talking about all of this. It's exciting times, honestly. A lot of this kind of thing <laughs> hasn't been done before. There's a lot of unknown circumstances or results going to come from this, but... I'm excited to see how it goes. On a lighter note, because this has all been fairly serious, <laughs> what would be your most memorable and or funny moment since entering Parliament? Um, I think someone asked me this recently, and I was really struggling, <laughs> struggling to find something that was um, which was actually funny that happened to me. <laughs> um, so um, I don't know if I if I have a good example for you in terms of funny, but maybe memorable. Um, a few things that have been really memorable for me. Um, one of the first things that um, I did in the first votes I participated in was declaring a climate emergency um, in 2020. Uh, I've really thought about that a lot and thought about how all of our actions have to be consistent with us agreeing that we're in an emergency situation. So that's something that it kind of plays, I suppose, plays on my mind in a, in a way that makes me reflect on on the policy that we're um, making. Um, I was there for the Dawn Raids apology that uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, made, uh, which was incredibly moving, um, incredibly powerful to be a part of that and to just be in in the same room during that time and you know the emotion for a lot of my colleagues and we've got one of the we've got the big, biggest um, Pacific Caucus um, that we've ever had um, in the Labour Party and to see how important that acknowledgement was um, was was incredibly memorable um, and yeah I think those are probably two two examples of really memorable things I suppose. Um, Another thing was getting the fair pay agreement legislation through. Um, when I uh, was younger, uh, one of my mentors was a woman called Helen Kelly, who was really active in the trade union movement. She was the president of the CTU, and she had really thought about how fair pay agreements would should be the the way forward um, for New Zealand. And she never got to see um, the, uh, the 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 Slaver government be elected, um, and she. Uh, I think would have uh, re been really proud of the fact that we were able to um, enact this legislation, which was consistent with her vision. And so being able to speak to that in the House was, um, yeah, really uh, memorable for me. Just going back to the climate emergency that you declared, 
I've seen a lot of questions in the media right now about whether we're going to meet our 2030 targets and then our 2050 targets. But I personally, and probably a few of our listeners, don't really know what that entails. Do you think we would meet our our 2030 targets? And if we don't, then what are we liable for? Yeah, I mean, I think, I hope that we do. And I think for the last three years, we've seen reductions in emissions, which has been, which is really good. Um, But we know that it's not enough. So I think that we need to continue with a program of, um, realizing that climate change is upon us now and for people uh, like me who live in Auckland or other places that were hit by a cyclone um, Gabriel or flooding earlier in the year that's that's not something that um, is abstract it's um, something that people are experiencing at the moment so I think we um, have to treat it seriously we have to look at the um, main causes of emitters which in New Zealand are are transport and agriculture and we have to make sure that those um, emissions continue um, to come down and I think including agriculture um, and making sure agriculture emissions do uh, are considered as part of our emissions targets is something that that our party's been really committed um, to doing and continuing to make sure that that is a part of it so um, I think we have to not go backwards but we have to do more and um, I don't really want to think about what happens if we don't meet our targets because I think we have to. I don't think there's an option with climate change. It's we we have to we have to reduce our emissions, and we also have to um, make sure that we are adapting to the climate change that's that's here now and will and will continue in the future. Do you know how New Zealand is tracking compared to other countries with uh, meeting their targets? I don't um, have that, yeah, comparative data, but I know that, yeah, for the last three years, our emissions have been reducing. So I think probably we'd, we'd universally all want to see a greater reduction, uh, but um, I imagine a number of countries are not in that position where they've had um, emissions reducing for the last last three years. So I, th- I think there's definitely more to do, um, and we definitely all need to do it because that's the way climate change works is actually one country doing really well is not enough we need to make sure that we're all reducing our emissions um to to have a a result on on making sure the warming is not what it's predicted to be (laughs) thank you so much for that i really appreciate it is there anything else you'd like to say harita before we close i had um one quick question based on the recent um, dental policy that was announced of free dental for under 30s and it kind of just got me thinking because I know there's um, other parties out there that are saying subsidized or free dental for everyone not just under 30s because obviously not all people over 30 actually earn a decent income either so there's that issue Um, but another thing that it kind of got me thinking about was in Australia or in Victoria anyway they have Um, a card it's called a Medicare card and basically with Medicare you get uh, free GP visits like unlimited if you go to a bulk billing doctor which most medical centers in Melbourne at least they are Um, and you also get subsidized dental and there's a whole lot of like benefits that you get for having that Medicare card and anyone that is an Australian citizen or even a New Zealand resident living in Australia can get that Medicare card which basically means you can go to the GP as many times as you need to in the year without having to pay a cent. Um, I wondered if New Zealand would ever think about doing anything like that. Now that there's, you know, this big push for free prescriptions, which is happening, and the government is trying to make healthcare a little bit more easier for New Zealanders, that we all know GP visits can be so expensive. And if, I guess, if you don't qualify to have a community service card, or if you don't live in the zone where there's a cheap GP, you end up paying $50, $60 just for a 15 minute visit. And that can be a huge barrier to people. So I wondered if the government or if Labour was thinking about introducing something to make that part of healthcare easier. Mm, I think that's, um, that's an interesting question. I think that, I mean, ideally, we would be able to provide um, more subsidised or cheaper healthcare for a greater um, percentage of the population. We do that for children now. So 
you know, children don't pay um, when they go to the GP um, at all. Um, and we've kind of uh, incrementally um, raised that um, the age of, of when you can um, have that free uh, care. So you don't need a card for it, but it's obviously um, targeted at a sector of the population. Um, I think, I mean, what the Prime Minister said at our launch on the weekend was that his ideal and idea and desire is to have um, dental included in healthcare like it is um, in some other countries and have that um, be free for all age groups. Um, the issue we have is just with the cost of that really uh, and not having the funds to be able to provide that at the stage uh, and also not the dentists to be able to provide that too. So there is a, a supply issue with um, making sure that we have the workforce to be able to implement that type of policy as well. So um, we've also committed to increasing the number of dentists that um, get trained, doubling the number, um, and there might be, um, uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure they might be on the green list at the moment, possibly anyway, but it might be that there's um, demand and we're able to get uh, dentists from overseas as well so uh, I think that's the desire um, I mean generally uh, there's a lot in terms of the political parties um, so like the Green Party that do have that policy of universal dental it's not something we disagree with in principle it's more you know how do we get there and when do we get there and, and just for us at the moment we just feel that um, it's not at the moment with how difficult things are for people it's not the time for increasing um, costs for people or big or big spending so we're kind of doing what we can within a constrained environment to make a difference but ultimately yes that would be um, a goal to have um, greater access to healthcare and, and both um, dental and other health services as well. Do you know whereabouts the support for funding free dental care for under 30s do you know where the government funds will be coming from? Yeah, I mean, our policy is um, fully funded in terms of that um, policy in relation to dental. Um, obviously, we have um, with uh, we've been having slightly. Well, I think actually it's decreased in recent times, but with um, wages rising and with people, more people in employment, there's been um, you know taxation that comes in that we um, can use for different. Um, uh, projects and funds and there's also been decreases in some government spending that we've made some programs that we're not doing anymore and uh, there's also been I think it was about it was several billion dollars that um, the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance were able to find through getting different departments to reduce their costs as well so I don't have all of that detail in front of me in terms of the exactly amount that that's going to cost over a long period of time I don't think it's um for 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 what would be a significant change for people I don't think it's um a huge cost in the scheme of things um but it is all it is all funded and it comes from yeah the way that we prioritize our um, existing spending yeah hopefully the comparison between what it might cost the taxpayer versus what the taxpayer might actually be getting out of it will be released. Mm. And a lot of us can see it. Otherwise, there's always these assumptions of, oh, you know, you're getting this free, but you're actually paying for it anyway. <laughs> it's yeah. It's way around now. <laughs> it's true. And I mean, I think some people will look at voting in that way, but I think a lot of people also vote on the type of society that they want to live in and the type of community that they want to have and what they expect um, for their neighbours and other members of their community that might not be as um, as able to pay for things. And so um, there are people who will, you know, look at the various calculators that parties have and decide to vote on who gives them the, the most money in their back pocket from from those calculations but there'll be other people who think well actually I, I want to live in a society where people have access to you know affordable public transport and cheaper dental care and um, health care that's not dictated by where you live um, and free school lunches and that kind of thing and, and that will be um, you know the place that they want to raise their children raise their family and how they see New Zealand so it will be um, there'll be people will just decide based on different things and there's no right or wrong way but um probably my my um my message would be it's really important that people get out and vote because um it is going to be a really close election and and people's vote does matter and will make a difference yeah it's certainly going to be an interesting one i'm excited mm -hmm. to watch it and 
I'm sure you're excited and potentially a little nervous and <laughs> maybe quite keen for it all to be over so you can spend some time <laughs> with your young one. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And a big thank you to our listeners. Uh, this has been Haley and Tarita with Camilla Bellic on Conversations with Wahini. Thank you so much for having me. 